Good afternoon. Very, very good. I heard something this week that uh, I felt was very true. They said, assumptions determine the results. And so it's my assumption that the passion you will pick up from the speaker this afternoon will help us go out and speak the truth, educate our communities in time to start a, stop a nuclear catastrophe at Vermont Yankee. <laughs> Helen Caldicott is a pediatrician and an anti-nuclear activist who opposes both nuclear power and nuclear weapons. In the 1970s, she spearheaded an anti-nuclear movement in her native Australia, which forced an end to nuclear, French nuclear testing in the South Pacific and managed to stop uranium uh, exports from 1975 to 1982. In the late 80s and early 90s, she became leader in the anti-nuclear movement in the United States through her role in ver reviving the Physicians for Social Responsibility. And she's helped uh, um, organize other groups like uh, Women Against Nuclear Dis uh, One uh, Development, and most recently her foundation ran a wonderful symposium in New York for three days, I think, that was really two days, incredible, uh, and which is online, available for all of us. But I first met Helen, I think in the early 70s when she first came to Harvard Medical School on a, a fellowship. And she came out and spoke at the first Earth Day at UMass. And someone said, oh, I just heard Helen Caldicott. She's over in a certain uh, room in a certain building. So I went over and indeed it did. Uh, really get me moving and thinking about it. And we were eventually able to shut down Vermont or Roe Yankee nuclear power plant. We were able to stop the Montague nuclear power plant from being built. <laughs> so it's my assumption that we're gonna shut down Vermont Yankee and we're... <laughs> And so, it's a great honor for me to present to you Helen Caldicott. Thank you very much. Um, it was Hattie and Francis who um, wrote to me and asked me if I would come out here. And I follow Vermont Yankee very closely and I see these wonderful women all getting arrested all the time <laughs> and making headlines. And that's what we've got to do. I think it's so easy to sit at our computers and do Twitter and Facebook and emails and think we're performing something. We're not. What these women are doing is putting their bodies on the line. And, <clears throat> and thus they get exposure. It's like the people in Wisconsin who took over the State House. They were fed up. And in fact, I don't know if most Americans understand what democracy means. It means that you are the leaders and your people you elect to Congress are your representatives. They are not your leaders. And the president is not your leader. He's your representative. And I think people, in a way, want a mummy and daddy. 
and feel safe if they're going to be looked after, but you're not being looked after at all, you know. Um, I don't believe in capitalism. You've got <coughs> in this... Well, I come from Australia where the Labor Party's always been socialistic, which was founded by the unions, but, you know, you've got a socialistic killing system to the tune of a trillion dollars a year, paid for by you. Um, you've got a socialistic uh, nuclear power industry paid for by you. And then Energy, who has no moral scruples at all, it's sort of sociopathic. Um, they just sell the electricity for a million dollars a day. You pay all the upfront costs and you'll pay all the down costs for a million years to store radioactive waste. That's if we're still here. I don't know if we will be. And they, they don't, they, they'll keep that thing running for as long as they possibly can. They don't care. And they, I think their office is in New York, Energy. That they don't even belong here. And somehow they got hold of Vermont Yankee. Um, so that's just a little sermon to start with. But I do want to honour these wonderful women and grandmothers. And you know, it's amazing to be at a meeting of all women because they say exactly what they think. And if you look at history, all revolutions have been led by women. But then they're written out of history, the Russian Revolution, the French Revolution, and on and on. And then it becomes his story. Yeah? So I guess I'd, I'd just like to say, in um, honour of these wonderful people, that 52% of the Earth's population are women. And we're really pathetic. Pathetic. You know, we let the men do what they want and, uh, and we sit back. We have the babies and we do the nurturing and all the rest. But we know in our hearts and souls what is right to save our children. And the fact is, right now, our children and grandchildren do not have a future. They don't. I live in Australia where global warming is so obvious and you've got it here, but you're denying it. You know, Hurricane Sandy was part of it. More and more catastrophic storms, frequency, the trend is up. We, had a, we broke so many records this last January in Australia for heat. Um, we had a day of 125 degrees centigrade. And the older you get, the less you can withstand heat. I was absolutely knocked out. I had to lay naked on the floor covered with a wet towel to recover for an hour. At the same time, there was a fire 35 kilometres away. You divide that by 2.5 to get miles, OK? And the wind was blowing at 100 kilometres an hour towards us, just a ferocious oven-like temperature. And we live in the middle of a, a eucalyptus forest, and eucalyptus trees just explode with the heat, just explode. The fire leaps miles and suddenly starts burning. We have everything packed, ready to evacuate. But much of Australia was consumed with fire this year. But houses were lost, homes were lost, but more. Our bush is full of kangaroos and goannas and wombats and koalas and snakes, and they all die as they get consumed with the fires. We always talk about ourselves as if we're, you know, anthropocentric. We don't care about other species. But that's what I always feel. And then just after that, we had the most horrific rains in Queensland. Cars washed away, kids being swept down the rivers, and still, we are one of the biggest exporters of coal in the world. They're opening up more and more coal mines. They're going to transport coal through the Great Barrier Reef, one of the seven wonders of the world, and uranium. And where does the coal go? It goes to China. In China, they can hardly breathe now in Peking. I don't know why those kids are walking out. Don't walk out. It's very important. It's their future. How do you make this sort of sexy to keep them in their seats? <laughs> it might be a bit boring scientifically. Anyway, um, yeah, we've got 40% 40, 40 of the world's richest uranium in Australia. We don't have nuclear power in Australia because it's too dangerous for us. We just export it so other people can have the joys of nuclear power plants, radioactive waste and meltdowns. The uranium in the Fukushima reactors was Australian uranium. Um, so we're killing people. And it's much worse than exporting heroin, because heroin only kills the heroin addict. Or tobacco, which only kills the smoker. But these 
nuclear power plants are carcinogenic factories. They make huge amount of the most toxic poisons the human race has ever known, which must be stored isolated from the ecosphere, according to the EPA, for a million years. So every time you walk through a door that goes psh, psh, it's either a carcinogenic door or a global warming door, which means your kids have no future, or our grandchildren. Because the predictions are, I mean, tipping points occurring with global warming now, the permafrost is melting. And in the permafrost in the Arctic are millions of tons of CO2 and millions of tons of methane, which are much more potent as a global heat trapper than CO2. Once that really gets going and is going now, it's too late. The predictions are now that the temperature by the end of the century will be six degrees hotter, and that's just average. But of course, you know, the temperature goes like this. We can't survive at those temperatures. And yet, we worry about education, immunising the children, teaching them how to speak properly and socialise properly. But they've got no future. So when you leave your lights all on all night and the computers and the rest, they're global warming devices or they're carcinogenic devices. And I ask people where they get their electricity from, they don't know. It's just flick the switch. Well, you don't have switches at home, we have to flick the switch off. You have to pull out everything at night. But Americans waste 28% of the electricity they use. Waste! By leaving all the lights on. And you know, the, you look at New York City, it's lit up like a firecracker at night. Why? For what reason? It's a sense of entitlement that is absolutely out to lunch. And it's your country that can save the planet. If you don't move the earth and most species on the earth, and I'm standing in a pulpit, God's creation, if there is a God, is doomed. Because we, in Australia and all around the world, we emulate you. Why? Because you've got great advertisements. And they're all orchestrated by Madison Avenue psychologists getting into our psyches. And it's all about coveting my neighbour's goods. If I just have that thing and that thing and that thing, I'll live happily till I die. And most people here are not very happy. You know, about 30% are on antidepressants. Happiness comes from serving others, from helping others. It doesn't come, it doesn't come from accruing goods and all of that rhubarb that people go on with. And that's what this culture is about. I won't go into the roots of capitalism except to say all those bankers who brought about the global financial collapse should be in jail. Now, I'm going to, so there are three things threatening the fate of the earth now, three major things, global warming, and it's unbecoming, and that's a gentle term, for Americans not to have solar panels on every single roof. In Germany, they have less sun than you, and much of their energy now comes from re renewables. California, bathed in sun, hardly any solar panels. Solar panels on the rooftops of the, all the car parks, so you plug your electric car in and drive away because it's a solar car. Don't buy an electric car if it's going to be a carcinogenic car or a global warming car, right? Um, windmills, there's enough wind west of the Mississippi to supply the whole of America with electricity. You've just got to upgrade the grid. Don't tell me America can't do that. America's been very smart. Now it's not so smart, because the only thing America makes now is weapons and guns. And everything else is made in China. Go to any shop and it's all made in China, because you've offshored all your industries. That's how the rich get richer and rent the 1% with cheap labor. It's, it's devastating. And the people without jobs, oh, they're retraining, but what jobs are they going to get? And then they say the older people have to work longer now before they get social security. What jobs are they going to do? There aren't any jobs. My mother 40 years ago was saying computers would put people out of jobs. Yeah, 
everything's almost computerized now. Even the lifts, the escalators in New York, you know, they're all computerized. Everything. Well, not, not everything, but it's coming that way. And we allow ourselves to be brainwashed through television, which I think is one of the worst things that ever happened in society, <laughs> to, um, to sort of accept everything that's happening uh, and everything goes through the neocortex and it's so quick you don't have time to think about it, into the midbrain where it lodges and has deep psychological ramifications. So, I mean, what I'm really saying, I guess, is that America needs a revolution. And it's these women that are leading the revolution. Like we had a revolution in the 80s, and I have to honour my colleague, Dr. Ari Hofand, who um, helped me start PSR in 1978 when he came to my office at Harvard and wanted some papers on nuclear power. So I was writing an article for the New England Journal about it. So we've, we've got the capacity, America has, to get off nuclear power and coal. And when Pearl Harbor was bombed, within seven months, all your industries, car industries, everything had changed to weapons industries, within seven months. Now that was only Pearl Harbor. This is the fate of the earth. Don't tell me that within a year you can't convert your whole country to renewable energy. Easy, simple and cheap. You can. But who's going to lead the movement? Who's going to be strong enough to stand up and speak the truth to power? There you are. A hand goes up. What other hands? Come on. Yeah, go on. Yeah. You've got to have guts. And I know it's hard because Americans like to please, you know, conform, have a nice day. I don't want to have a nice day. Everyone tells me to have a nice day. I don't want to, you know, unless I feel like it. You know, thank you for calling at and I didn't want to call at and in the first place. <laughs> Straight teeth. Conformity is antithetical to revolution. Eccentrics are the interesting people in society. Now, so we can close down all the reactors because they only produce 20% of the electricity you currently use. You waste 28%. Don't ever, ever again use a clothes dryer. Hang your clothes outside in the summer and in the basement by the furnace in the winter. Who makes clothes dryers? GE. What does GE make? Nuclear power plants? Yep, so you've got to use their electricity and nuclear weapons. They're a wicked, wicked, wicked company. And if you read my book, If You Love This Planet, it says it right there. And in fact, I was booked to appear on the Today Show when the book was published and they read, then they read the book <laughs> and they said, no, she's no longer acceptable. Um, so, uh, yeah, don't use clothes, clothes dryers. You know, you don't need all this electrical gadget, gadgetry that make, tends to make life, you think, easier, but it doesn't. You can think of lots of ways you can save power. So you can save, you don't need nuclear power, period, because you waste 28%. And, uh, you know, the country can be totally converted to renewals within a year. If you've got the guts and you take on your politicians and you see your politicians every time they come home to your district and you go and educate them with doctors. Take Ira in his white coat. He knows exactly what's going on in all areas nuclear. Take him and educate your politicians. Yeah, you've got quite good senators. Um, who have you got now? You've got... Uh, Warren, she's great, but she probably doesn't know much about nuclear power, nuclear war. Teacher. And she, I'm sure she's teachable because she's highly intelligent. And then you're going to get Markey. If you don't get Markey, and I don't want to come back to Massachusetts again. And he's great. He's great on nuclear power. I've worked with him since 1975. Um, but you, 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 have, you are their leaders. And if they don't vote the way you want them to, you door knock and get rid of them. That's the threat and that's a democracy and that's getting out and using your democracy and teaching Mr and Mrs Joe Sixpack out there what's happening to their planet and to the future of their children. It's called preventive medicine. Okay, so that's nuclear power. Nuclear weapons are still on hair trigger alert, ready to go. It could happen tonight by computer error. There are 10,000 legitimate hackers no, 1,000, I think, legitimate hackers into the Pentagon system per day. Chinese, 
I've got a son, grandson aged 16, very undeveloped frontal lobes, smart as hell, and you wouldn't trust him as far as you could kick him. You know, he and his hairy friends go through hi, grandma, and you don't know what they're going to be doing next. You can imagine a highly intelligent, maybe Aspergerish, 16-year-old who might think it's a hell of a thing to tap into the early warning system and actually blow up the planet. Because they do crazy things, these kids. So in other words, our life is hanging by a mere slender of a thread. Every day, every minute, and every night. And we are like lemmings practicing psychic numbing, rushing towards the cliff of annihilation. If there's a nuclear war, and Ira's got it all taped now, there would be, I mean, every town and city probably with a population of 50,000 or more is targeted here. I think there are 10 H-bombs, according to McNamara, when I wrote an article with him, targeted on New York. And they talk about terrorists. We have to take all our clothes off at the airport because of terrorists. That's Cheney's paranoia that did that. But, who is a sociopath anyway, is. But, but the real terrorists are Russia and America. Of all the weapons in the world, and there are about 19 or 18,000 now, Russia and America own about 94, 97%. And they've got the gall to point at Iran and say, ooh, you're not to have one. Or North Korea, ooh. See not the moat in the other person's eye, look instead for the moat in your own eye. And you've got a president, I think now, who would like to eradicate nuclear weapons, but he said, I can't do it without you. And everyone's sort of, yeah, you know. Obama. You've got to get passion in your souls or we're not going to survive. We are not. And it's nice to get older and have grandchildren and stuff, but, and then people say to me, well, we've got to teach the children. That's not fair, to leave a world that's in such chaos with no future, and we've done it. So it is up to us, older people, to lead the revolution to save our children and all future generations and species. So that's weapons. Russia wants to eradicate nuclear weapons. America doesn't. And I want to write a book about this. But, you know, there are moves, but I don't think strong enough. So we can eradicate nuclear weapons. Sure, we can. Undo them. We can close down all the reactors in this country, which is what I'm going to talk about, and we can stop global warming. And then we can die with relatively clear consciences and this whole thing can be done within 10 years, if you've got the courage. Do you? Okay, now, I'm going to teach you about radiation. Um, the, you can't really... Uh, I'll have to shout. This is a chart of a 20-year-old reactor like Vermont Yankee, and it's a can-do, it's a... a, a, a a Canadian reactor. And I'm going to walk you through all the radioactive poisons that are present in a nuclear power plant like Vermont Yankee, 50 miles from you and your downstream, the Connecticut River, which almost certainly carries radioactive fish. And the fish, people catch the fish here. This is tritium, hydrogen, H3, which is very carcinogenic. It's a beta emitter. I won't go into all of that now, but I did, I did, um, publish a book called, or write a book called Nuclear Power's Not the Answer, and I go into what tritium does in the body. Brain tumours, fetal abnormalities, um, very rare muscle cancers, rhabdomyosarcomas, and many other things. Nasty stuff. Half-life, 12.2 years. You multiply that by 10 to get its total toxic radiological life, 120 years. The fish are probably concentrating that for sure, because it goes algae, concentrated orders of magnitude, then crustaceans, orders of magnitude, then little fish, and then big fish. So there's biomagnification of these elements in the food chain, and then we stand at the apex of the food chain, so they concentrate most highly in our bodies, thyroid, breast, uh, um, liver, bones, and the like. Um, a nuclear power plant can't operate without releasing all the tritium it makes every day into the air and water. Into the, and, and the reactors at, um, is there one reactor or two at Vermont? One uses about a million, million gallons a minute to keep it cool. And the tritium's going back into the river. 
and other elements. So I'm just going to walk you through. You won't have heard a lot of these, but and some last seconds and some last millions of years. It's a heterogeneous sort of cocktail of poisons. Beryllium, carbon-14, nasty stuff lasts for thousands of years. And, and our genes are made of carbon. Of course, our bodies are made of carbon, so it gets right into the DNA molecule producing mutations. Silicon, phosphorus, 32, sub-35, chlorine, argon, two isotopes of argon, potassium, 42 and 40, calcium, scandium, scandium, scandium. More, go right up. Vanadium, manganese, iron, iron, cobalt, cobalt, nickel, nickel, zinc, selenium, krypton, krypton, rubidium, strontium, strontium, causes bone cancer and leukemia, yttrium, and a lot of these haven't been studied from a biological or physiological point of view. We don't know where they go in the food chain or in us. Yttrium, zirconium, or Niobium, there are I think five niobium isotopes, molybdenum, technetium, ruthenium, rhodium, palladium, silver. Now the cattle around Fukushima are, are collecting silver in their bodies, radioactive silver. Cadmium, more, four isotopes, indium, tin, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven tin isotopes, antimony, four, tellurium, one, two, three, four, five, more, ID. This is the one that causes thyroid cancer. Uh, but that RD129 has a half-life of 17 million years. That got out of Fukushima, causes thyroid cancer. Cesium, this is what the, the only one they're really measuring in Fukushima and in after Chernobyl. Barium, lanthium, cerium, presidium, ne neo neodinium. neodinium. Thanks. Samarium, one, two, three, four. Europium, more. Uh, gadolinium, yeah, two, terbium, dysprosinium, holmium, I don't even know half of these, thallium, thallium, uh, lutium, hafnium, tantalum, tungsten, more, uh, in, iridium, four, platinum, thallium, four, lead, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, more, all radioactive. Bismuth, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Polonium, this is deadly. This is the star polonium 210 that killed Litvinenko, that Russian man who took tea at Claridge's and someone dropped some, a drop of polonium in his tea, terribly poisonous. And he died within two weeks with his hair falling out, white and blood cells, white blood cells and platelets dying, he died of massive hemorrhage of infection. One, two, and this is the stuff probably in tobacco leaves that causes uh, lung cancer in, in smokers because it tends to collect at the bifurcation of the bronchi where there's turbulence and it's very radioactive. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Astinium or something, I can't pronounce. Radon, you know how dangerous radon is because you live with granite here and you have to have your cellars ventilated because this is one of the main carcinogens now recognised by your government. Frankia radium, this is what gave Madame Curie leukaemia and her daughter. She used to walk around with it and lump in a lab coat pocket. Her bones were so full of radium when she died, she had to be buried in a special place because she was radioactive poison. One, two, three, four, five. Actinium thorium, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And they talk about thorium reactors. Thorium is not naturally fissionable, so you have to mix it with uranium-325 to produce uranium-232 and 233. 233 is fissionable but incredibly toxic and radioactive. Then you have to reprocess the spent fuel, melt it and concentrate it nitric acid, and from that remove the plutonium-233, which is terribly toxic, and then you can make nuclear reactors from it and bombs. Next. Proctotinium. Uranium. Now these, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, these are all alpha emitters and terribly carcinogenic. Neptunium, plutonium, which is one of the worst, and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, plutonium isotopes more. Americium. Now americium 241 is a decay product of plutonium 241, and that's terribly radioactive gamma radiation like x-rays and it's an alpha emitter. 
and I don't have a whiteboard to describe all the sorts of radiation. But so Europe, which is contaminated with plutonium, they're terribly worried because this is going to start appearing in more and more concentrations and be terribly dangerous for people as a carcinogen. Um, so there are five. Curium, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Ber Berkelium, Californium. I think the, and that's it. Did any of you have any idea that that's what they have in Vermont Yankee? Well, that's what you need to know, and you need to take that chart and you need to hang it up in the Vermont legislature and the Massachusetts legislature, because Vermont Yankee is right on the border of Massachusetts, this is your problem. You need to educate everyone in this town about this. And then you need to teach them how radiation causes cancer. Now, the next slide I want to show is, um, no, it was mine, fell in the floor, yeah. Now this is Europe, here's Chernobyl, and there's the blown up reactor. When the accident occurred at Chernobyl, the man in charge was an energy specialist in hydroelectricity, not even nuclear, and he did a crazy experiment in the middle of the night, and the thing reached really critical mass and it exploded. And the control room filled up with white dust, and he said to his two younger men, go out and see what's happened. They went up and came back and said, it's gone. He said, what? What's gone? They said, the reactor, it's gone. He said, don't be ridiculous. Go back and check. Yeah, it was gone. The three of them died within two weeks of acute radiation and illness. But more than that, this thing burned for 10 days and it scattered. This is only cesium-137, which is what they measure, out of all those isotopes I just showed you. And they were all released, all over Europe. And you can see that these red areas are areas where people mustn't live. Sweden got a hell of a dose, as did um, Norway, is that? I can't read it. Anyway, they're the Scandinavian countries. England got a big dose. There are lands still growing in England, which are so radioactive they can never be sold on the market, full of cesium. Turkey got a hell of a dose. Don't buy any Turkish foods. They're sold in organic markets, and they say they're organic. In truth, all food's organic, let's be frank, um, not inorganic. And uh, they said, well, it's organic. I asked the man who's selling it, and I said, yeah, but is it radioactive? I do not buy European food, because I don't know what batches are going to be radioactive and what are not. And I rang the man in Australia who tests the food, and I said, what do you do when you find radioactive food from Europe? He said, oh, we dilute it with non-radioactive food. The solution to pollution by dilution is the latest when it comes to radiation because it reconcentrates that in the body. You see? So, and cesium lasts 300 to 600 years. Nuclear accidents never end. Never end. Because this stuff hangs around for the rest of time. Plutonium 24, 239 is a half life of 24,400 years. A quarter of a million years, it's toxic. That Vermont Yankee makes about 500 pounds of plutonium a year. You only need 10 pounds to make yourself a bomb, because that's what bombs are made of. And one millionth of a gram will give you cancer. And it has to be stored isolated in the ecosphere for probably half a million years. That's what Vermont Yankee means. Plutonium got out all over Europe. I have the next slide, thanks. Now, here's Japan. So here's Fukushima. Luckily, for the first three days, 80% of the radiation blew across the Pacific and dumped in the Pacific. They have released more radioactive elements into the Pacific Ocean, all the ones I showed you, than ever released in the history of the human race. This is the greatest industrial accident ever to have occurred. Then the wind blew and changed and blew towards the northwest. And the Japanese government and the American government knew where the plume was going, but they didn't tell the people because they didn't want to create panic. Panic. So the people evacuated right into the path of the most intense radiation. There are towns here, there are 10 million people still living in Fukushima, which is so radioactive that the Russians proactively removed everyone from these radioactive areas, but in Japan they haven't. This is a huge, wicked, criminal cover-up in Japan. 
The doctors are involved, many of them, in the cover-up. And you can see, this is Tokyo, Tokyo got a big dose too, and if you measure soil and dust from Tokyo apartments, it's so radioactive, it would be sent to a radioactive waste dump in America. And people are living with this all the time, inhaling it, eating it in their food. The government's encouraging Fukushima farmers to start growing their rice again and their mushrooms and everything, and they're feeding it to kindergarten children. Children are 10 to 20 times more radio sensitive than adults. They get cancer much more readily. Women are twice, twice as sensitive as men and fetuses thousands of times more so. They've started already within two years to look at over 100,000 children here in this prefecture with thyroid ultrasounds. And they've found of 100,000 children, about 43% have thyroid cysts, fluid filled cavities or nodules, solid tumours. They are only testing by fine needle biopsy, drawing out the cells to see if they've got cancer in, in nodules greater than a half a centimetre in diameter. The others are left. You can get cancer in a tiny, tiny little nodule. Already four, two, three children have had their thyroids removed for thyroid cancer. You can't survive without thyroid replacement every day like a dog. diabetic or you die. Seven more are suspected. Now, in Chernobyl, there's been a very excellent report um, written by the, um, or reported by the New, New York Academy of Medicine, no, New York Academy of Science. Um, and they took 5,000 articles from the Russian literature, epidemiology, medicine, and the like, and they translated them for the first time into English. And all sorts of diseases are caused by radiation, cataracts of the eye, premature ageing in children. There are homes full of the most grossly deformed children around Chernobyl than we've ever seen before. If you watch a film called Chernobyl Heart, you'll see them because in the first three months, the developing embryo develops all its organs. And then the next six months, it just grows in size. So if you've got some plutonium that's going to kill the left half of the brain or the septum of the heart, or the, right, the cell that's going to form the right arm, you're born grossly deformed like that drug thalidomide did for pregnant women. Um, except plutonium is in the environment now for the next quarter of a million years. We've never seen in the history of medicine anything like this before. Um, an epidemic of diabetes, and I want you to listen and apply this to you. Because Vermont Yankee is extremely dangerous, it's a Mark 1 GE reactor, the same as those Fukushima reactors. It's old, it's degrading, dilapidating. One of the cooling towers just fell apart, and there's a picture of that here with water pouring out of it. It's, uh, and it's tipping uh, radioactive water into the, uh, the river consistently, and you're done water, and you're done wind. So every day it releases xenon, krypton, and argon into the air which when inhaled into the lungs are absorbed through the lungs and deposit in the fatty tissues of the abdomen and upper thighs where the gonads are situated, the testicles and ovaries. Radiation damages genes in the sperm and the eggs to produce genetic diseases. Now we all carry several hundred genes for genetic disease, cystic fibrosis, diabetes. We don't know till we marry someone with that gene. My specialty is cystic fibrosis, the most common fatal genetic disease of childhood. How many children have I helped to die? Many. That's why I do this work. Or help children to die of leukemia. But the other day, guess what? One of my children was diagnosed with a, an illness disease called hemochromatosis, which is an abnormality of iron metabolism where they can't excrete iron, so it collects in the liver, causing cirrhosis in the heart muscle, causing you know, very severe myocardial damage in the heart. Anyway, so that means I am a carrier of hemochromatosis, and so is my ex-husband. And you don't know until you mate with someone with the same recessive gene, it's like the gene for blue eyes, you have to have two, two genes for blue eyes to get blue eyes. If you have one gene for brown, one for blue, you've got to have brown eyes or two brown eyed genes. So, and it might take 20 generations for a new mutation to get together with the other one to form disease. But what we do know is there are over 2,600 genetic diseases now described. And as we fill 
the environment up with more and more and more radioactive elements in the food, we're going to see an exponential increase in genetic disease. And we're not the only creatures with genes. All plants and all animals have genes. Um, so Fukushima is an absolute disaster. Don't ever buy any Japanese food again. Don't eat miso. Don't get seaweed. I went to a sushi restaurant in New York the other day and they're all eating fish. And I said to the cook, you know, doing his lovely stuff, where do the fish come from? They come from Japan. 63% of fish caught off Fukushima are radioactive. And the currents will take the radiation up around and down along your west coast. Your EPA is not measuring your fish. Your EPA has stopped measuring the ambient levels of radiation coming from Fukushima. There were three meltdowns in Fukushima within the first two days, three days, and they didn't tell the Japanese people for three months. Guess what? It's exactly the same as what would happen to you because your Nuclear Regulatory Commission, which is paid for by the nuclear industry, will not tell you. They have got a new chairman called Alison McFarlane, who I know she's good, but you know she's outnumbered by, there are five people in the commission. Um, she's a geologist. So you're, no one's protecting you. And the only ones who can protect you are yourselves. And you have to understand that if you eat food with cesium in it, a fish, or some rice from Fukushima, and lots of the rice grown in Japan is in Fukushima, so the Japanese government is diluting it with non-radioactive rice. There are radioactive pigs running around Fukushima. So there are some wild boar in Germany that are so radioactive now they have to be shot and buried in a radioactive waste dump because they eat the truffles and the mushrooms. What you need to know is when you eat something that has radioactive elements in it, and these are called internal emitters, not external radiation like x-rays, it takes five to 80 years for the cancer to develop. And how does radiation cause cancer? It mutates or changes a gene in a cell that regulates cell division. And the cell sits dormant, quietly, for five to 80 years, and then one day, Instead of dividing into two by mitosis, it goes crazy and produces trillions and trillions and trillions of cells, which is a cancer. And we normally can't stop that growth. And these cells are very invasive and get into blood vessels and go up to the brain and the liver. So cancer is a parasite, thriving as the body degenerates and dies and then the cancer dies. And we generally can't stop cancer, so it takes a single alpha particle from plutonium to hit a single gene in a single cell to kill you. Whereas if I sneeze on you, in two days you're sneezing. The incubation time for cold or flu is two days. Measles, mumps, chicken pox, three weeks. Cancer, it's a long time. And that's why the nuclear industry says no immediate risk. And the journalists say to me, well, no one's died at Fukushima. And that's why I set up the symposium in New York on the medical and ecological consequences of Fukushima to try and teach those journalists some radiation biology and some basic elements of radiation and medicine. It was really they attended medical school for two days. We have to educate the media. Well, the New York Times didn't really come. Anyway, that's beside the point. All the news that's fit to print. Um, I'll have the next slide, thanks. Now, this is a picture of what I just described. The radiation, ra radioactive iodine obviously concentrates in the thyroid gland. And the fact that we're seeing so many abnormalities in the first two years, and we didn't see thyroid cancer in Chernobyl in the survivors for five years. And over 6,000 people have had thyroid cancer in Chernobyl. Over a million people have already died from Chernobyl in 28 years. And remember, I said the, the food's going to be radioactive for eons. Nuclear accidents never end. So the, it means that the children in Fukushima got a hell of a dose of radioactive iodine. But that only mirrors the sort of dose they got from all the other elements they were engulfed in and inhaled and are eating in the food. There are about three times more radiation escaped from Fukushima than at Chernobyl. Much went across the Pacific, but lots in Japan. And Japan is very heavily populated compared to Chernobyl. 
So a pregnant woman eats strontium-90, which goes to the bone, causing bone cancer leukemia, gets through the placenta into the embryo, causing leukemia or cancer. Cesium-137 causes brain cancers and other cancers I've described, and they all concentrate through the food chain, you can see, and then into the, in, into the pregnant woman. And they say that the nuclear industry, they make worldwide dose limits based on the atomic uh, bomb survivors, which is a totally flawed study. They ignore the human fetus, they ignore internal emitters, which are those, they ignore genomic instability, which makes the genes unstable. They ignore the latent period of carcinogenesis, the incubation time. Um, they, and they only look at thyroid cancer, no other cancers. All cancers can be caused by radiation. No radiation is safe. Never walk through those X-ray machines in the airports. Each dose you get adds to your risk of getting cancer, each dose. Do not have unnecessary X-rays. Doctors are not God, although we play God sometimes. Ask your doctor why you have to have an X-ray. CT scans give you a hell of a dose. Don't have CT scans unless it's absolutely necessary. People who have a lot of dental X-rays have a higher than normal incidence of brain cancers. We're seeing this more and more now. People who use fluoroscopies, cardiologists, they are now getting uh, cancers, uh, brain cancers on that side of the body because that's where they stand next to the patient with very high x-ray doses. Radiation is cumulative. Each dose you get adds to your risk of getting cancer. We already see so much cancer. It's just heartbreaking to see a patient die of cancer. And you are right in the line of fire here. I don't know how many, I mean I... <laughs> Well, I'd be with the, with the people who would go to the Mont Yankee, but I, they get publicity, but I, you've got to be cleverer. You're not getting enough, and the media is not really attending. And I'll tell you something a little bit shocking, but it got the media. I was at a conference where Gorbachev was speaking in San Francisco, in the Herbs Theatre, where they signed the United Nations Treaty, and there's a man called Patch Adams. Do you know he's the Dr. Clown? And we were talking about Y2K and there could be a nuclear war. And he went up to the mic and he said, look, I've been telling Hel Helen since, um, you know, July we should take our clothes off and walk across America. And I thought, oh, God, patch. Anyway, so I went to the mic and I said, hands up, those who will take their clothes off. Every hand went up, like 300 hands. So we went out into this sort of red velvet lined foyer and I thought, I don't know. So anyway, I got my gear off. But I left on my scarf that covered the naughty bits and I left my pearls on. <laughs> that patch, he got everything off straight away and so did everyone else. And then I, there were fat ones, skinny ones, tall ones, and the human body naked is actually a thing of beauty. It really is. We cover it up with our clothes and that's what we doctors see. It's medicine is a sacred profession. You know we examine our naked patients and hear their most intimate details. Then I thought, oh, well, we'll go out onto Van Ness Avenue. So we started walking stark naked, and it was cold and dark down Van Ness. And someone started chanting, nudes, not nukes. Nudes, not nukes. <laughs> and someone said, I'll ring the media. Well, they were there in a flash, because they didn't want to talk about YGK or possible nuclear war and annihilation of life on the earth. They wanted to see the naughty bits. So we marched down and guys were driving home, you know, and they'd go, uh, uh, and they'd pull up and stand and they'd clap. They didn't even know what we were doing or why, but they knew it was brave. We went down to the corner and I thought, I don't want to go up in Black Maria to an American jail stark naked. So we came back and when we got back to the foyer, no one got dressed. I've never seen such a crowd of proud people who'd done something totally benign and innocent, but brave. And I'm standing on the phone, stark naked, talking to the ABC radio, you know? Eventually, and we got in the New York Times the next day. Now, I'm not saying you should get your gear off, although it's an idea, but if you did, you would get international publicity. You see, the media is so blasé now, and you can talk sense and science till the cars come home, like we did in New York the other day, which was brilliant. And still they won't come. So you've got to use your imagination and just let the ideas flow. 
I mean, if there's an election, you get, well, the, these women probably do it, but when someone's standing for Congress, you get up behind them and have big placards, you know, Vermont Yankee will cause, and have pictures of fetal defects and deformed babies and all the rest. I mean, make it come home. And I guess what I'm saying to you as a, as a physician is, um, what I do is practice global preventive medicine. If we have a disease that's incurable, the medical dictum states we must prevent it, like we did with smallpox, and we're doing with polio, rubella, and whooping cough, and the rest. Now we've got to do it with cancer. I don't know if we'll ever really find the cure to cancer, and it's such a hideous, hideous way to die. My father died of cancer in three weeks at the age of 51, my beloved father, and he built two houses out of asbestos to educate us. So, I mean, and the family never was the same again. So, um, I'm going to dedicate my next book to my beloved father. And in fact, if I think deeply, maybe I've been doing this work for Philip, Theo Philip Bronowski, who was my father, who was a wonderful man with red hair and a fiery temper, and funny as funny, the absolute stability of our family and mum and dad were passionately in love and when he died her world fell apart and she really died of a broken heart. So that's what carcinogens do and all the rest of the family live to old age. So I've had it, I've seen my father die but I've, I've helped lots of other people to die too. And um, I think we need to realise how precious life is, how lucky we were to be even conceived that of the millions of sperm that night, each one different, your sperm reached your egg. And that's such a privilege. And we're not here to make ourselves happy. We're here to save the creation. That's why we were born this generation. That's why I do the work and that's why I honour so much these women who go to Vermont Yankee and I hope you will all do this now. Thank you.